appreciate it. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I want to begin by thanking all my counterparts, uh, all the ministers of defense from all of the nations represented here today at another one of our full counter ISIL meetings of defense ministers from the entire coalition. Uh, this is something we've done and we're going to do periodically. Uh, and I thank them for joining us as we continue to rigorously evaluate, plan the next steps of, and further accelerate our campaign to deliver ISIL a lasting defeat. And critically, it, it is a critically important time for the military campaign, and we had a very productive discussion. Thanks to our global coalition, to our clear and deliberate campaign plan, our dedicated local partner forces, and the sacrifices of our country's military personnel, we now have momentum in this fight and clear results on the ground. And today, we made the plans and the commitments that will help us deliver ISIL the lasting defeat that it deserves. I'm going to provide a brief update on these conversations, after which General Votel and I will take your questions. By the way, Joe's been doing an absolutely spectacular job as our CENTCOM commander uh, and uh, running this campaign on a daily basis. Uh, and he delivered uh, excellent presentations to the group here, so I very much appreciate it. Um, as I said earlier today, our coalition's military campaign plan has three objectives. First, to destroy the ISIL parent tumor in Iraq and Syria. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. As recent attacks remind us, ISIL safe havens threaten not only the lives of Iraqi and Syrian peoples, but also the security of our own citizens. And the sooner we defeat ISIL in Iraq and Syria, the safer our countries will be. So our second objective is to combat ISIL's metastases everywhere they emerge around the world, and third and most important, to help to protect our homelands. In January this year, we updated our comprehensive coalition military campaign plan to accomplish the military aspects of these three objectives. And we've pursued a number of deliberate decisions and actions to accelerate this plan and hasten ISIL's lasting defeat. And since then, play after play, town after town, from every direction and in every domain, our campaign has accelerated further, squeezing ISIL and rolling it back towards Raqqa and Mosul. By isolating these two cities, we're effectively setting the stage to collapse ISIL's control over them. Thanks to the hard work and sacrifice of our local partners and our service members, and more contributions from the nations that met here today, we seized opportunities, reinforced success, taken the fight to the enemy. But we're not going to rest. Today, we reviewed and agreed on the next plays in our campaign, which, of course, we won't discuss publicly yet. But let me be clear, they culminate in the collapse of ISIL's control over the cities of Mosul and Raqqa. Now, before I continue, I want to say that we're aware of reports of civilian casualties that may be related to recent coalition airstrikes near Manbij City in Syria, which is one of the last junctions connecting Raqqa to the outside world. We'll investigate these reports and continue to do all we can to protect civilians from harm. Being scrupulously careful to avoid civilian casualties and being transparent about this issue is a reflection of the civilized nature of this coalition. Getting back to the future campaign and the next plays, after detailing those next plays, we identified the capabilities and the support required to execute those plays. Since our first full defense ministerial in Brussels in February, our nations, including the United States, have provided even more support to accelerate the campaign as our local partners have made advances. But we're all going to need to do more. For the United States part, President Obama decided to deploy an additional 560 troops to support the Iraqi security forces in their offensive to retake Mosul. And on my visit to Iraq last week, where I met with Prime Minister Abadi and Defense Minister Obeidi, 
who, by the way, is here today, and I was pleased to speak with him, and he spoke to uh, the other ministers several times. I offered to share some of our hard-earned expertise in countering ex improvised explosive devices with the Iraqi security forces. In fact, the director of our Joint Improvised Threat Defeat Agency, Lieutenant General Mike Shields, is in Baghdad today meeting with Iraqi officials to discuss this topic, a pledge I made to Prime Minister Abadi last week. And uh, I can, I, I, given uh, the requirements that we spelled out to supply the capabilities needed in the coming steps in the coalition campaign, other countries in the room indicated their intent, like the United States, to contribute more. Uh, I'm going to have to leave it to those countries to announce their own contributions, but I have to say it was very encouraging to see so many countries be willing to do so much more across such a wide spectrum of capabilities, all the way from uh, uh, strike aircraft through to training and vital work in logistics, stabilization, uh, and other aspects. Uh, I can name a few uh, coalition countries that will be making new and additional contributions uh, who have already indicated uh, they've made these public. I'll just remind you, France is sending the aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle back to the region to car carry out airstrikes against ISIL. Australia is committed to expanding their training of Iraqi police and border guards, which will be vital for securing Iraq after the defeat of ISIL. The United Kingdom announced in recent weeks that it would deploy more, more personnel to Iraq, adding more trainers and engineers to help the Iraqi security forces, and so on. Together, we're going to ensure that our partners on the ground have what they need to not only win the fight, but also to hold, to rebuild, and to govern their territory. The biggest strategic concern of this group of defense ministers was that the stabilization and governance efforts will lag behind the military campaign. Making sure there's no such lag must be a significant strategic priority for us. We discussed it today, and it will be an important focus of our conversation tomorrow at the State Department with our foreign ministry counterparts. And of course, as I said earlier, destroying ISIL's parent tumor in Iraq and, and Syria is necessary, but it's not sufficient. ISIL's influence and activities continue to pose a threat to all our countries. And today, we also discussed how we can continue to combat ISIL wherever it might attempt to take hold around the world, and how our military campaign can best support our national government's efforts to protect our respective homelands and people. But we had a very full agenda today. I was pleased to hear so many of my counterparts emphasize the importance they place on defeating ISIL. I'm confident we made the plans and the commitments we'll need to build on our momentum and deliver ISIL the lasting defeat it deserves. Thank you, and General Votel and I will now take some questions. We've got a microphone in the room, and uh, we'll begin with Lita Belver. If you could identify yourself. Hi, thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, can you tell us um, whether you got any additional assur assurances during the meeting from uh, the Turks about the operation of Incirlik Air Base? And how concerned are you that some of that unrest in the country could have spillover effect into the fight? And uh, for General Votel, uh, we've heard some rumblings about uh, some of the military commanders believe that they are willing to look at additional U.S. forces if needed down the road. And I'm wondering if you can say whether or not the, any of the additional 560 troops have actually moved into Iraq, and do you see that as sufficient for now, and if not, for how long? Thank you. Good. Okay, I'll take the first question, and, and, and Joe, if you can answer the second one. Uh, first one with respect to Turkey. The, the Turkish representatives were here at the meeting today. I'm very pleased at that. The minister could not make it for reasons that are very understandable. I spoke to the Turkish defense minister yesterday, uh, and uh, first of all, to tell him that I was glad that he was 
safe and and in in uh, that the, his ministry was uh, functioning, which he assured me that it was, um, and uh, obviously to tell him uh, uh, that I had been concerned for him and that we support the democratically elected government of Turkey. But on the military side, uh, he assured me first very clearly that uh, Turkey, that nothing that happened over the weekend will interrupt their support for our collective counter ISIL campaign. And with respect to bases like Incirlik, because it was a coup that involves some elements of the military, they've been very careful for a while about operations at a number of their bases. That, that includes Incirlik, uh, but he, res he assured me that, that they'll be returning to normal uh, there in, at Incirlik uh, shortly. And uh, so our campaign, and General Votel can speak to this, uh, hasn't been affected by that uh, at all. And you're absolutely right, there are alternatives to that. Um, but uh, again, he, he indicated to me that he expected operations to return back to normal. It has pretty mo mostly to do with the power uh, there at Incirlik uh, very soon. Uh, so I was very pleased to, to, uh, to talk to him. Uh, let me ask Joe if you, you can add anything to that, but I, uh, principally on the second question about U.S. Yeah, capability. Thanks, uh, thanks for your question. Uh, so we, you know, with the recent announcement of the, of the additional 560, we're, we're doing the final planning and preparation to, to move those, uh, those elements in. Uh, we have not moved any large numbers of that, uh, of that additional force in yet, but we will very, very shortly, and so I, I'm, I'm pleased with uh, with the authorization that we had to do that. It will it will make a difference for us as we prepare for the next uh, phase of the of the campaign. Um, to the second part of your question on future uh, requirements, I won't get into too many details there. I will just tell you what we have tried to do is link our request for additional capabilities, whether they're U.S. or coalition, to specific objectives that we are trying to tie. Uh, we are trying to achieve within the campaign. So as we move forward, as we continue our campaign operation, I do think we will, as we've done with our with our with our coalition partners, we will look to add additional capabilities that are necess necessary for us to accomplish our objectives. Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, can you talk about the pace of expected operations and moving into Mosul, moving into Raqqa? You said a couple of times over the last few months it seems to be a little faster than expected in both cases, given what, how Fallujah went. Uh, what, what kind of time frame are you looking there, and are you satisfied with the progress? Um, also, uh, can you give a bit of a report card of the, of the Manbij fighting, uh, specifically the, um, the performance of the local fighters the Americans have been training, the YPG, YPJ, et cetera? Sure, I'll start, and then Joe, if you can uh, 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 follow up. First of all, with respect to the positioning of forces for the envelopment of um, uh, Mosul in Iraq, uh, just to draw, give you a picture of the mechanics of that, this involves uh, the training and equipping, first and foremost, of forces, mostly in the south, where we and our coalition partners do a lot of training, and then repositioning them. That has gone right according to plan, uh, including the Kiara West uh, seizure, which has always been part of the plan, the establishment of base uh, there, uh, which our 560 uh, will contribute to helping the Iraqis to establish. That'll be the southernmost envelopment of Mosul. And then in the north, it's uh, Kurdish forces, which is why I have worked so closely both with Prime Minister Abadi and President Barzani uh, uh, so that to make sure that there's complete cooperation uh, uh, between them, which there is, uh, because they're mostly Kurdish forces that will comprise the envelopment from the north. So that's all going to occur in the next few months, and Joe can add to that if he wants to. And then last on Manbij, uh, my observation, but uh, Joe, Joe would know that uh, 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 better, so I'll let General Votel. Uh, speak to it, but my, my observation is that the, the Syrian uh, Arab forces that are fighting in Manbij are fighting very hard and very well. Obviously, we're in a support role there, uh, advising, providing air support, and so forth, uh, but they, it's been a tough fight 
uh, but they've certainly been um, uh, 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 strong in carrying the fight to the enemy there. But let me ask General Botel, both of yeah, those. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Well, so on, on both your questions, first off, I think one of the key things we took out of the, or I took out of the meeting this morning was, with respect to Mosul, was we shouldn't underestimate the amount of preparation uh, necessary to take on an, an operation like that. It's a, it's a big city, two million people, large uh, geographic area. So we want to make sure we're well prepared. So things like force generation, making sure we've got the right stabilization plan in place, and we've got the right political aspects in place here uh, to help manage that city after the fight is done, I think are important, uh, important aspects. And I think we generally all coalesced around that idea this morning uh, as we talked about it. Um, with respect to Manbij, I, I've been extraordinarily pleased with the performance of our partner forces, the Syrian Arab Coalition uh, in particular. Uh, this, is a, this is, as the Secretary said, has is, is been a very difficult fight. Uh, this is an area that, uh, that uh, the Islamic State is trying to hold on to. Uh, and what I've been most impressed with is the deliberateness uh, and the discipline with which our partner forces have conducted themselves. They are moving slowly, they are moving very deliberately, mostly because they're concerned about the civilians that, uh, that still remain in the, in the city of Manbij. And I think that, uh, uh, that that speaks very highly of their values and speaks very highly of what they're, what they're about here. And I think, we've, I think we've picked the right partners for this operation. I'm, I'm very pleased. Let me just second what General Motel said at the very beginning about most of our conversation today was not, in fact, about the movements of forces because that was planned a long time ago, and that's going fine. Most of our conversation today was, as General Motel indicated, about, about what happens after the defeat of ISIL in Mosul, stabilization plans, reconstruction plans, uh, and so forth. And uh, we're identifying the requirements there, which are large, because as General Motel indicated, it's a large city. And it's that conversation that it lies behind my statement that I think the biggest strategic concern of the defense ministers here uh, was for the stabilization and reconstruction, which are not purely military aspects of the campaign, and to make sure that our plan, that the planning and the execution of them is in time for the execution of the military aspect. Uh, Pauline, and then Thank you. Uh, for both of you, um, I understand that you're talking now about uh, what happens after Mosul and what happens after Raqqa, uh, but are you concerned at all that even with the military battlefield successes that we are, that the counter-ISIL coalition is having, that you're winning the battle but losing the larger war as the attacks in Nice and other places show? Well, I, as I said, I think defeating ISIL in Iraq and Syria is absolutely necessary. Uh, it's necessary because that's where ISIL arose. That's where it claims to have a state based upon this evil ideology, uh, where it claims to have a capital. And we need to destroy the fact and the idea that there can be a state based upon this ideology. That has to be done in Syria and Iraq, but that, that, that's not the entirety of the campaign. Uh, the campaign extends to other parts of the world, Afghanistan, Libya, and so forth, and it extends to the protection of our homeland because there are people who can either come there or who are there who are infected or affected directly or indirectly uh, by this same ideology. So all three of those fronts are very important. And um, uh, Iraq and Syria, as I said, it's necessary to do that, but that's not enough. That's not gonna be sufficient to provide us entire protection. We're gonna need to do all three aspects of the campaign. I, I, w I would just add that I, I thought we had a very clear-eyed uh, discussion about uh, ISIL this morning. And uh, you know, we, talked, uh, we talked about the fact that it's a connected network here, that what it does in Iraq and Syria does have impacts outside of the area, uh, but yet our focus on them in, in Iraq and Syria is necessary to disrupt that. It's part of the process. The second thing we talked about is that they are vulnerable. We are having success against them in a variety of ways. Their resources, uh, uh, their forces, their ability to hold terrain. Uh, and so they, they are vulnerable and we are taking advantage of that. And the third thing we talked about is that this is a very adaptive enemy. And we should expect, as we've seen in the past, that they are going to move away from being a symmetric type force to a more asymmetric type force, a more terrorist 
uh, type force that we've, that we've seen. And so I, I thought the discussion uh, about that was very, very clear, and I think everyone left with a, with a good understanding that what we do is important, but it, as the Secretary said, it won't be sufficient uh, to address the global piece, which we are also addressing. Mr. Secretary, um, we've publicly heard from Kurdish officials about their frustration about not being invited to this defense ministerial. Um, given the important role that they've played in the past in this counter-ISIL campaign, and as you've talked about the important role they're going to play in retaking Mosul um, from the north, why weren't they invited? Was it any particular government, such as the Iraqi government, um, that had a disagreement about inviting them? Um, and if I could just push you a bit more on the strike uh, north of Manbij um, that appears to have killed uh, more than 50 civilians. Hundreds of airstrikes um, from the U.S.-led coalition have targeted that area, and human rights groups have sort of doubted that it could be anyone but the U.S.-led coalition. So what does this say about the intelligence um, that's being used um, in this counter ISIL campaign? Okay. Uh, let me take the, the first part. Uh, first, the, the Kurdish forces have been, have performed spectacularly well in the course of the counter-ISIL uh, campaign and make a very strong contribution. Uh, the, uh, the, therefore, the, the cooperation between the Iraqi government and the Kurdistan regional government under President Barzani is very important. I spoke to both of them last week when I was in Baghdad. I've spoken to both of them on many occasions. Uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page in the campaign. Uh, so they know, and Kurdish forces know, that they're an essential part of the campaign. And uh, by the way, not only the United States, but many of the other coalition partners are, are supporting the Peshmerga as well. We're supporting them in salaries, others with equipment uh, and supplies uh, and so forth. And so we make sure, and I make sure personally, uh, because I've made this promise to Prime Minister uh, Abadi and to President Barzani that I would make sure that our communications about the progress of the campaign uh, between them was seamless and that it would be conducted in the way that the Iraqi government is, uh, under Prime Minister Abadi is uh, conducting itself and we support this kind of conduct which is a single a unified but also decentralized country uh, that respects uh, the variety of people. And I think the last thing I'll say apropos of that is, is, is to write that um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abadi has established and President Barzani and his, his advisors in a very important part of a Nineveh Popular Mobilization Committee, which is to think about events in Mosul after the collapse of ISIL's control, very much along the lines of stabilization. It's a complicated place and, and with a, a number of a, a complex social composition and a number of different groups of people, all of whom deserve a better life uh, than the one they have over ISIL. I'll just say one more thing. I don't have anything much more to add, but I'll see if General Votel does about uh, your question about the man I, the I think the important thing I would stress is that we will conduct an investigation of any possible civilian casualties in this matter, as we always do, and we'll be transparent about that. Uh, that is because that is a reflection of the values that we bring to this campaign, uh, the values of the countries you saw in that room uh, today who want to behave and conduct themselves in a civilized manner. And that means when you're, when you're, uh, uh, there's a possibility of something like civilian casualties, you promptly investigate and are transparent about it. That's what we're going to do. Uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, I think you've addressed it pretty well. I, I would just add that, uh, you know, I, I think the, uh, I, I don't think it's a, any kind of indictment of the intelligence community. It is an extraordinarily dynamic uh, situation up around Manbridge right now. As, as we talked about a little bit earlier, it's a, it's a very difficult fight. ISIL is, is trying to trying to hold on to that area, so we do see them showing up at a variety of different locations, and so uh, when it's a dynamic situation like that, we have to, we just, we have to respond, and uh, I think that's the situation in which we found this particular, uh, this particular uh, operation taking place, which, which we're currently investigating to kind of get to the, get to the facts uh, about what actually happened there.
Thank you. It is Pierre Ghanem from Al Arabiya. My question is about uh, the campaign relied until today on the ground on local forces. Is there any opening for other forces from outside Iraq or outside Syria to do the work on the ground, to fight on the ground? Are you considering sending any troops? Were you offered during this meeting troops from other countries around uh, from the coalition? Uh, well, uh, the approach of the coalition, generally speaking, is to support and enable and empower local forces. That is in recognition of the fact that they will need to, after they expel ISIL from their territory, will need to hold and govern it. So in the long run, outsiders can help, but they can't substitute for local forces. So our whole strategic approach is that. Uh, at the same time, you would be wrong if you didn't think that there were out members of the coalition countries, including the United States, on the ground in Iraq and Syria. There are. Uh, the, it, the, but their, their job, their principal job is to support these local capable forces in achieving these objectives by bringing the full weight of everything the coalition has, intelligence, air power, logistics, supplies, training, and eventually stabilization and reconstruction to bring to bear to help them so that they can reclaim their territory uh, from ISIL. So that's the strategic role that they're playing. But I emphasize that they are there, and we appreciate that on the part of our coalition partners. And as the American Secretary of Defense, I, I, there's no, nothing I take more seriously than putting American service members in a situation that is inherently hazardous. Uh, so they are uh, in that theater. They're flying every day uh, overhead, and there's inherent risk uh, in that. And I just want to remind everybody that uh, uh, there, there, there is uh, uh, risk here uh, for our people. We need to respect that, and they're performing so spectacularly. But that's our role. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, were any concerns raised today about, um, particularly from some of the Arab states, about the campaign extending beyond the Middle East too quickly or distractions coming up as a result? Uh, I say this in light of the uh, Brazilian issue coming up today with the concerns raised about the Olympics and a group aligning themselves with ISIS there, uh, and then also, obviously, the ongoing discussion about what to do with Libya. Thank you. Uh, well, there was discussion of the fact of and the possibility of further spread of ISIL around the world, so I wouldn't say that wasn't discussed. It, it was. In fact, there was a session devoted entirely to that that was led, as it happens, by the French uh, defense minister. Um, so this is a global coalition going after what is a global problem. Uh, no question uh, about it. So I've spoken a lot about Syria and Iraq simply for the reason that I described earlier, which is that, that, that that's where it began. We need to take care of it there. But you're absolutely right. It's everywhere else, and we did talk about it. Anything, Dan? No, I think you got it, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah. And, uh, oh, I guess one other thing, Dan, I could say is I, I, certainly there, no one in the room from anywhere <coughs> believes that's dilution. <laughs> I mean, you use the word dilution. I, I, it's necessary. I mean, we're, we're going to have to, to do it. So it's not a distraction. It's an essential part of the campaign, uh, these other, other places. I so I wouldn't use that word uh, for it. it these are uh, uh, essential uh, things as well. And we did talk about a number of them in our approach uh, uh, to them. And I think we all recognize that that's part of the campaign, if that's helpful to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I have two questions about Turkey. Um, since the attempted coup last week, there has been a sweeping crackdown in Turkish society. Just today, we've seen over 20,000 teachers being sacked. Given that NATO membership does involve a commitment to democratic principles, do you believe that Turkey's membership in NATO could be at risk if this crackdown continues in the coming days? Turkey's and finished. secondly, if I could just follow up on that from the, the flip side, since the attempted coup, there has been a vigorous debate in Turkey about its own relationship with the West. President Erdogan is now meeting President Putin in the coming weeks. Have you received any indication or, uh, from the Turkish side in your conversations with them that they are reevaluating their relationship either with the U.S. or with NATO? 
Tur Turkey's been a strong ally for decades. Uh, as we've faced together all kinds, a great variety of problems, from the Cold War to uh, today's counter-ISIL uh, campaign. So the alliance is very strong, and uh, our relationship's very strong. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, we uh, respect and support the democratically elected uh, uh, government there. And no, I don't have any indication from the, as I said, I had a conversation with the Turkish Defense Minister uh, yesterday, um, and uh, he uh, uh, assured me that Turkey's participation in and support for what we're talking here about today, namely the counter-ISIL campaign, uh, is unchanged, and he'd like to be here if he could, but obviously due to the circumstances, his delegation was here instead. So there hasn't been any change. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow at the State Department. Thanks, brother. Thank you, Mr.